Are you looking forward? It's going to be a time of growth. We're going to meet God in a very, very special ways. We're going to get to know Him better. We're going to grow together as a community. We are going to become more effective as His servants, as the people that are doing the work that He calls us to do. He is an amazing God, and we're going to be really learning so much about the amazing nature of our God. Um, you saw a little bit of from, from Tim Keller, and we'll be, you'll be getting to see more of him, especially in these small groups, as you gather together. Um, we'll be having, there's a guide that is out there that if you don't have and you need, um, you can go to the info desk and be able to get one. Um, in terms of the, the, the way that the small groups will be meeting, the discussion questions and all the things that you can do. But it's going to be an amazing time. It's a time of growth, a time of personal transformation. The main focus will be um, the, the parable, the third parable in Luke chapter 15, um, the, para, the parable that relates to the lost sons. But today we're going to start um, by introducing this series with Luke chapter 15 verses 1 to 10. Um, there are two parables there that I want to um, be sharing from. So let me read this. I'm not sure whether there'll be anything on the screens, um, but I want to read the Word of God to us. Yeah, I know you stood just now, but please stand. Let's just, let's just have this Word of God as we share it and on our feet. Hopefully it'll keep your ears um, listening to what God says. The Bible says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And if he, when, when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Father, we thank you for this word and this parable, these two parables of Jesus. May you use them to open our eyes, to see you and to see your purposes, your plans, that we might live in them. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, we're, we're, we, as we're looking at these parables, one of the things to keep on remembering, keeping in our minds, is that, is that these parables of Jesus, um, Jesus tells them they all come out of those first two verses where the Pharisees were muttering where the Pharisees were muttering. I wonder what your reaction would be, what you would do. If you found your pastor, Gary Karedi, you know, somewhere, you know, hanging around with, with drunkards and, and prostitutes and, and those people that you're thinking of, the most corrupt, some of the ones that you mentioned um, a little bit earlier. And, and if, you saw, if you saw me hanging around with those kinds of people and, and finding that that's, those, are the, those people are so connecting with me, would you mutter? I think some of you would. Maybe not some. <laughs> Maybe many. You know, because, but these are the kinds of people that seem to be attracted to Jesus. These people were coming to Jesus and he was accessible to them. He was with them. And, and the good guys, the moral guys, the Pharisees, they were upset by this. They muttered. They were complaining. And in fact, the muttering of the Pharisees is what triggers these three great um, parables that Jesus gives, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost sons, the parable that we often refer to as the parable of the prodigal son. These famous parables, we know them quite well, and, and we generally take them as, you know, as, as showing us how God's grace changes the life of the individual Christian. It changes my life as an individual. But we want to examine this and more than this because, because these things, you know, help us to also see how the grace of God not only changes us individually, but also forms us into a unique kind of human community. We're going to be discovering that the grace of God, the gospel, 
creates a completely unique and distinct kind of community. A community that the world has never seen before. I want us to see this. I want us to be discussing it together when we're in our, in our groups over the next seven weeks. And so if you're not in a group, you're not in a CLG, get into one. If you're in the CLG, just set yourself up for that. Make sure that you're available for all the seven weeks. Make sure that you participate um, in learning what each of these parables, and especially, of course, the parable of the lost sons, will be teaching us about how God's grace creates this unique community. This unique community. Now, when you want to understand a parable, one of the best ways to do it, since it's a metaphor, it's a word picture, it's communicating things through images, is to meditate on the images that we get. And so I want us to look at, at, the, at three images in this first sermon, the sheep, the search itself, and the shepherd, and see what these images will teach us about how God creates, grace creates community. First of all, the sheep. The sheep. Now, when you and I hear about the sheep and we hear that we are sheep and, and Jesus is the great shepherd, it makes us feel warm and, and safe and, and we're thinking about green pastures and, and quiet waters. But you need to know that when the Bible refers to Jesus as the great shepherd and to us as sheep, it is very important, it's a very important and very well meant insult. It's a spiritual insult. Here are the words of someone who was a shepherd before he became a pastor. He said, a sheep is a stupid animal. It loses its direction continually in a way that a cat or a dog never does. And when you find a lost sheep, the lost sheep rushes to and fro and will not follow you home. So when you find it, you must seize it and throw it to the ground, tie the legs together and put it over your shoulders and carry it home. That's the only way to save a lost sheep. Okay. <laughs> Let's think about the meaning of this, about, of this metaphor. And there are two things that it teaches us. The Bible is telling us something really about ourselves. The first thing that it teaches us is like sheep, we need to be rescued. We constantly need to be rescued. And when the sheep sees grass, no matter where it is, no matter how steep or how dangerous the spot is, they just go for it. And they keep eating. Even though, you know, that they go to a place that's impossible to climb down from, they eat the grass until it's gone. And then they either have to be rescued or else they'll fall to their death. You know, in this next picture, the sheep... Um, in, the, in, the, in the picture, there's a sheepdog, and it's very alert, keeping the sheep from the edge. Because guess what? If these things go, they, you know, they'll eat that grass, and they won't be looking around for anything else, and they can easily go over. And the next picture, you know, shows a pile of sheep that had done just that. You know, they had gone to the edge, and one after the other, they fell off the cliff. At the very same spot onto the same place, and they're all dead. Why? They're sheep. You know, we are always ourselves looking for something to feed our souls, something that can meet the deepest cravings that, in our, that are present in our hearts for happiness, for significance, for security. It might be image, it might be status, it might be wealth, it could be family, it could be that Mr. or Miss X that you're dreaming about that you want to fall in love with you. But whatever it is, if you're feeding your soul anywhere, but at the hand of Jesus, our great shepherd, you're like a sheep on a ledge, in a dangerous place. For example, you're dating someone, Miss X or, or, or Mr. X, and it's and it's one thing to be in love and, and, and hope that that person marries you, but it's something completely different to feed your soul on this. And that's to say that, you know, you're resting your heart's deepest hopes on that person and that relationship. And you're saying to yourself, you know, I know I'm somebody. I know, you know, I feel secure about the future. I know I'm valuable because this person loves me. You know what that means? It means that you're like that sheep that's gone up to that place with grass in a very dangerous place where when that grass is gone, 
if you break up, if something goes wrong, even if you got married and stuff went wrong, you won't just be disappointed. It'll be a complete plunge. You have no self left. You'll be, you'll be gone. You'll have no hope left. And the Bible says that we are all doing that. We're all doing that. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. And so like sheep, we need to be rescued. But you know, the metaphor doesn't just teach us that all sheep have to be rescued. It also teach us, teaches us how thoroughly, how thoroughly they need to be rescued. Remember the, 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 what the shepherd said about the sheep. If you found a lost sheep, your job isn't over. You know, because the lost sheep won't follow you home. You, you have to grab it and you have to throw it down and then put it over your shoulders and take it all the way home. You know, you, you, if, you, if you look for your dog, if your dog is lost, what will happen? If you find it, it will follow you home, isn't it? Or you can even just point the direction and it will and it, and it, and go and it will find its way home. All you need to do is to point it to the right direction. Not a sheep. Not a sheep. And do you know what that means? A sheep can contribute nothing to its salvation. Nothing. A shepherd to rescue the sheep has to take it all the way home. You know, the shepherd has to do everything for, for the sheep. It's not cooperation like, you know, with a goat or a dog, you know, that the shepherd does something and then the animal does something. You know, the shepherd has to go home for it. He has to carry it all the way home. Put it on his shoulders and go all the way home for it. You know what that means? It's relating to this biblical doctrine. In a bi biblical doctrinal language, it says this, that we human beings are utterly lost in sin and can do nothing to contribute to our salvation and we have to be saved purely by grace. Purely by grace. Not by cooperating. We are sheep. You know, it wouldn't have helped if God had sent us great, a great teacher who tells us and, and gives us wonderful examples, an inspirational picture of just how we should live. And then we try and emulate him and, and try and, and live our best. We try to live like Jesus. You know, many times when you ask people, you know, what does it mean to be a Christian? They, they say, you know, it means trying very, very hard to live according to the example of Jesus. So you think you're a dog. You think maybe you're a goat or a cat, but you're not. You're a sheep. We're sheep. I mean, that's what we are. A teacher wouldn't have been enough. In fact, a teacher wasn't enough. We have so many stories in the Bible. You know, the Bible says that God sent many, many prophets, and, and, and people wouldn't follow. People rejected them. They even killed them. Jesus himself said that he would send, you know, sages and, and teachers, but he also knew that we would reject them. We would chase them out of our towns and, and even kill them. Sheep with teeth, eh? Sheep that bite. So we needed a savior. We needed a savior. We needed somebody who has to do everything that we need to bring us all the way home. You know, there's a time in the past where, where it was very popular to think that, for example, children are born innocent. And education and cultures are the things that, that mess us up. That, that we are essentially innocent. And that idea of original sin and the sinfulness of human, by, of, of human beings is rejected. And one of the great um, philosophers associated with this idea was a, was a philosopher from about 200 years, just a bit over 200 years ago, called Rousseau. But after... Two world wars in the intervening time, after the genocides in Germany, in Rwanda, in Bosnia, after global terrorism, you know, after, you know, we get so dis disillusioned with all the leaders and all the institutions that, that we've been setting up, everybody who looks at the facts knows that this idea is wrong. This idea is wrong. Alan Jacobs wrote a book on original sin and he quotes a secular critic named Randall Gerald who says this, he says, most of us know now that Rousseau was wrong. That man, when you knock his chains off, when you free him up completely, he set up the death camps. And soon we will know everything that the 18th century didn't know about human capacity for selfishness, greed, and violence. And I'm sure we are, we are seeing it all the time, isn't it? Now, if you're somebody who says, I can't accept the idea of original sin and how every human being is sinful, how negative! Look at the facts. You know, 
stop and think about that little baby who is, you know, biting her mother's nipple and then looking up, you know, and giggling with glee because the mother showed the pain, yeah? The facts pull us back. The facts pull us back. Blaise Pascal, another famous philosopher, he struggled with this doctrine of original sin, and yet at one point he says, nothing jolts us more rudely than this doctrine. And yet, but for this mystery, the most incomprehensible of all, we remain incomprehensible to ourselves. You cannot understand human beings if you don't understand, you don't recognize this truth. So if you don't believe that you're hopelessly lost in sin, just give it time and be honest. Look at the facts. So this is what the sheep illustration teaches us, that we are sinners, we have to be saved by sheer grace, by pure grace. Now what does the search tell us? Again, it's important to remember the context for all these parables in verses, is verses 1 and 2 of Luke 15. Jesus didn't tell these parables just simply to say, you know, now I've woken up this morning and I'd like to teach people on sin and grace. He was responding to verse 1 and 2. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now in those days, to invite someone into your home, to welcome someone and actually eat with them, meant much more than it does today. It meant an offer of friendship. It was, a, it was an invitation in a way of saying, I want to be in community with you. I want to be in community with you. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law are absolutely dumbfounded. How? You know? How? That Jesus is seeking to build a faith community with these people. These people. And they're thinking in their minds, there's never been a faith community with people like that inside it. You know, those people are excluded. Because after all, faith communities are based on the idea that you are obeying God and that you are practicing God's ways. And, and these people aren't doing so. They can't be in community. We can't be in community with them. And clearly it's Jesus' effort to create a new kind of community that the world has never seen that brings up this huge objection. And in response, Jesus gives all these parables. One thing that comes up through these parables is, is, is joy is the rejoicing that he speaks about that happens in heaven. Rejoice with me. I found my sheep. Rejoice with me. I found my coin. The, 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 the father says, you know, holds a party because of his son. There is huge joy in heaven over a sinner that repents. So what is Jesus saying? You know, he's saying, I've come from the community in heaven that celebrates sinners saved by grace. That's the joy that motivates the heavenly community. And he says, I'm creating a community like that here in this world. What's a community? There's one dictionary definition that says, a community is a group of individuals who have been bonded into a body through intense common experience. Maybe common history, you know, in, in different ways. And, and, and by the way, the more intense the experience that you've had together, the stronger the bond and the stronger the sense of community. And Tim Keller tells a story of, of a Bosnian man living in, in New York who he met. And, and this guy said to him, boy, in election year, you Americans, the Democrats can't stand the, the Republicans. The Republicans can't stand the Democrats. They think they're crazy. You're just at each other's throats. It sounds like Jubilee and Nasser, how we've operated here. But then he said, I'm a Democrat, a strong Democrat. But when I meet a Bosnian who's a Republican, it's totally inconsequential to our relationship. That's interesting. Why? And he said, well, because we've been through life and death. Even a Bosnian that I've never met before, I know that he's been through the same life and death experience, and that creates a bond that more, that's more important than whether you're Democrat or Republican or whether you're white-collar or blue-collar or rich and poor, whatever, anything else. Everybody has identity factors. You're male, you're female, you're ethnicity, you're a hustler, or you were born into a, a wealthy family, you've made it through, it, it through a good school, you've achieved this thing, or you've achieved the other. All these things are factors of, about what you understand yourself to be. All these are part of your identity, your self-worth and self-image. What makes you distinctive, what makes you feel valuable. And these different factors are all there, but some of them are more foundational 
than others. Some are closer to the foundation of who you truly are. And for example, for this man who mentioned his son, he mentioned that his son had grown up, grown, gone to law school and, and was a lawyer in the city. And even though his son certainly valued being a Bosnian, the fact was he'd never been through that life and death thing. He'd never been through those experiences. And as a result, he could see his son felt more oneness, more bonded with the other white-collar people than with, you know, blue-collar Bosnians. They just, he just wasn't as comfortable. The more intense the experience, the more it goes beyond all those other factors. A life and death experience is a bond that makes all the others inconsequential. It's the, it's the big thing that just makes everything else mean so much less. You know, you've all seen those movies about, you know, two or more people who don't like each other. Maybe they're very different from different, very different backgrounds, but then they go through some kind of life-death experience together. And on the other side, you know that you, they now have a bond that is thicker than blood, isn't it? And those of us who watch action movies like me, you know, a lot of action movies are based on that idea. They're buddy movies. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul begins the chapter by saying, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Verse 5, God made us alive with Jesus Christ even when we were dead. For it is by grace you have been saved. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And then at the end of the chapter, after saying a lot, of, a lot else, he says, with, you know, verse 20, 21, with Christ Jesus at the, as the chief cornerstone, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Now, now think of this, of this metaphor. You know, other religions say that you're saved by following the rules, observing the rituals, you know, doing all the things that you ought to do. In other words, these are the religions, they treat you like a dog or a goat. You need help, you need pointers towards the things, and then you'll be fine. But in the gospel, we're sheep. We're sheep. We can contribute nothing to our salvation. And when the gospel dawns on you, and you understand what Jesus has done for you. It's like dying and being reborn. It's not like getting a steroid injection and, you know, suddenly you've got extra energy. It's, it's not just an inspiration. It's a life and death experience. Because when you understand the gospel, you start to, you know, to recognize things like, I'm feeding my soul on, on things that are going to kill me. And, and I'm running away from my shepherd. But I'm not just infinitely lost. I'm also infinitely loved. I'm infinitely valued. I'm his treasure. I'm his treasure. I'm one of his coins. I'm his treasure. He, he leaves the 99, the flock, and he goes off after me. He turns the house upside down searching for me. I'm his treasure. These parables aren't just saying I'm infinitely lost, but I'm infinitely valued. The shepherd will do anything to bring me home, and he does do everything. To bring me home. It's grace from first to last. And when the gospel dawns on you like that, when you understand that gospel, do you know what that does? It blows away all your other identity factors. Everything else is blown out of the water. You know, let's just say, for example, your identity factor, your foundational identity factor is, you know, I've raised a great family. My family and kids are just fine. Or I'm a moral, very, very, very Bible-believing person. Or I went to this very good and world-class university. All those are uh, identity factors that they bring, they bring a joy. They, make, they give you a feeling of, of value, isn't it? They give you a joy. But in every case, what are you doing? You know, look who I'm connected to. Look what I've done. You're getting a joy from being it. You're getting a joy from doing it. You know, it's what makes you feel good about yourself. But it's a joy that automatically makes you feel superior to the other people who don't have that factor. You automatically feel better than the person who didn't make it to that university. Why? Because that's what separates you from them. You know, you automatically feel better than the person whose family is, is falling apart. You automatically feel better than the people who aren't living good and strong moral lives. Automatically. Yes, it's a joy. It gives you a joy and makes you feel great, but it's a joy that excludes tax collectors and sinners. It excludes moral failures. It excludes all types of people. But Jesus Christ is able to create a new community, a community that the world has never seen before. Because now, you know, it's a new joy 
that we get is a joy that is, that is about being saved by grace. And if your new identity is, I'm infinitely lost, I've been saved by pure grace, and I'm infinitely loved and valued. Now that's a joy that can't make you feel superior to the people on the outside. It doesn't make you superior. That's a joy that, that creates an absolutely new kind of community. Because on the one hand, it's a community that, first of all, keeps you from looking down at the people outside. But secondly, it creates a bond unlike any other with the people on the inside. You know, those other people who have gone through the life and death experience of, of, of coming in contact with the grace of the gospel, of being brought from death into the life of God. And that's the reason why Paul, you know, at the beginning of chapter 2 of Ephesians can say, you know, we died and are risen with Christ through grace. And at the end of it, he can say, with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Now, where does he get this idea? It's an idea that comes from, from 1 Kings chapter 6 where we're talking about building the temple of God, Solomon's time, building the, term, the temple of God. And you know, at the quarry, the masons worked very hard on the blocks. They took the stones and chiseled and hammered them until they made them so perfectly that when they were brought to the building site, the temple went up in silence. In total silence. There was no hammer. There were no chisels. There was no need for mortar. Why? Because at the quarry, they had been so perfectly formed that when they came together, they fit perfectly. And Paul is saying, if you've been to the quarry, if you've been through the life-death experience of grace, then when you meet another Christian, you fit. There's a bond. You've been through life and death. And it doesn't matter, you know, whether you know, you're a Kikuyu or a Lua. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, white or black. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter whether you're old or you're young. You fit. You know, I've traveled around quite a bit, both locally and internationally. And no matter where you are or who you're with, once we, we start talking about Christ with another Christian, we're connected. It's just an immediate connection. We feel that bond. You know, the key is Christ at the center. Is that your experience as a Christian? Maybe not. Maybe you're saying, you know, well, I, I think I'm a Christian, but I don't feel that way because when I see these people, they say they are Christians, but I feel like, and there's something else that, that comes to your mind. Then maybe you haven't been to the quarry. Maybe you're a cultural Christian. Maybe you've, exper you've not experienced that life-death experience. Or on the other hand, maybe you forgot and you started thinking that you're a dog. You stop thinking, you stop, stop recognizing that you're a sheep. That is all from God and He's done it. You know, people, you're a Christian first and then you're white or black or Asian. You're a Christian first. Then you're a Kikuyu or a Kalenjin or a Kisi. You know, I've heard people saying, you know, I was a Kikuyu first before I became a Christian. So I'm a Kikuyu then Christian. No. That was the past. In Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And now you're a Christian first who happens to be a Kikuyu. This thing that God does, this death life experience, this thing that we go through, it's beyond every other identity factor. And, and you know, when you meet somebody else who's gone through that same life death experience of the gospel, a person of different ethnicity, different class, different background, maybe the kind of person that you've always been told, you know, you should never trust that person. You know, all your life you've been told that tribe or that class of people or those kinds of people shouldn't be trusted. And when you as a Christian meet another Christian from one of those kinds of groups, all of those barriers are knocked down by Jesus Christ. And you are a brother, you are a sister, we are one family. Let's conclude by looking at, at this shepherd. When Jesus Christ says, I'm the shepherd, he's making an astounding claim because, you know, shepherds totally control the lives 
of the sheep. Totally. The shepherds aren't consultants to the sheep. They're not kind of, you know, watching. But the sheep are absolutely dependent on the shepherds for absolutely every part of their lives. And so when Jesus is saying, I am your shepherd, which is what he's saying here, he's also saying, give yourself to me completely. Give yourself to me completely. Now, we modern people don't like the idea of losing control, giving off over control of our lives. I don't know whether there's been any age in any time where people have loved losing control, but this is why you should do it. You know, Jews celebrate the Passover to commemorate the time when God led them out of Egypt because on one particular day, you know, by every family slaying a lamb, putting the blood of the lamb on their doorposts and eating that lamb, and, and by taking shelter under the blood of that lamb, the angel of death passed them over. And so every year, from that time, they remember the salvation that came through the blood of the lamb that was shed by having a Passover meal. At every Passover meal, you had bread and you had wine and you had a lamb. Now, when we come to the New Testament and we look at the Passover meal that Jesus had, just on the night before he was betrayed, before he, were, he, he died, he had Passover with his disciples. But when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and even John, you'll see that there's bread, there's wine, but there's no mention of a lamb on the table. Why is this? Because the Lamb of God was present. The Lamb of God was at the table. And in this new covenant, Jesus is the Lamb. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and every other Lamb was pointing towards this one. And here's why you can trust Jesus. Jesus is the one shepherd who became a sheep, became a Lamb to save you. And by doing that, He has brought you home. He's carried you all the way home. Now please trust your shepherd. Trust your shepherd by not only committing yourself to him, but also committing yourself to one another. Because, you know, what we are learning here is that if you believe in the gospel, that belief creates a new community, a new kind of community. And it's our job to realize that community in our midst as we walk together. And, and I want to, you know, just ask us to commit to doing two things, ways, two ways in which we can focus on building community. The first one, I want you to commit yourself to building a community that is filled with beautiful, unified difference. Accepting people from very different. And if you're a person who comes here and, and you're looking around and you're wondering, you know, you're a Christian and you've come in and you're saying, hey, I don't see my kind of people around, then please stay. Because we need you. We need you. We need you so that we might become the church that Jesus Christ was setting up, the kind of community that Jesus has been setting up all this time. And maybe you need to come and join together with us so that the Lord will build you up and together as the church we become this place of beautiful, unified difference. Because you see, no matter what differences we have, at the cross... Jesus has broken down every dividing wall and we are brought, all of us, into this one family. But secondly, let's commit to build a place where sinners are free to admit that they are sinners. A place where sinners are free to admit that they are sinners. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, every other community is based on performance, living up to certain things, and therefore you're never allowed to be a sinner. You're never allowed to admit failure. You know, it's like survival of the fittest. When, a, when one member of a herd starts to limp, it is abandoned or even eaten, isn't it? But a Christian community has got to be different. And Bonhoeffer's comment is really, he's commenting on James chapter 5, verse 16, where it says, confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. And he says this, Religiosity and morality permits no one to be a sinner. Everyone must conceal his sin from him or herself and from others. But it's the grace of the gospel which is so hard for the religious to understand. The grace of the gospel confronts us with the truth and says, You are a sinner. You are a great desperate sinner. Now come. As the sinner you are to God who loves you 
He doesn't want anything from you. He doesn't want a sacrifice or a work. He wants you alone. This message is liberation through truth. The mask you have to wear before everyone else will do you no good before him or before your brothers and sisters. Confess your sins to one another. Get the freedom of being sinners before one another. Confess your sins to each other and be healed. Now, what Bonhoeffer is really saying there is he's saying if you become, by the gospel, a member of Jesus' flock, then you become a person who is kind and patient with other people who sin. Obviously, you should, because your self-image is based on you being a sinner who has been saved by grace. And you know, interestingly, it says also there, he's saying that when, it, when, when we are told to confess our sins to each other, as we are told in the scriptures, to confess our sins to each other and heal each other, it's not just talking about now a community of sheep. It's also talking about a community of shepherds who are supposed to confess to each other and heal each other. You know, we are all shepherds and how did that happen? How did we suddenly become the healers of one another? Well, the answer is, we can go from being witless and selfish sheep to being shepherds to each other because our great shepherd, Jesus Christ, turned himself into a helpless sheep and died for us, gave himself for us. I don't know where you are. In understanding this wonderful gift of grace that we have been given as, 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 as the people that God is reaching out to, Maybe you've never actually entered that family. Maybe, maybe you've been a part of that family and, 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 and somehow, as you're listening to this, you've realized perhaps you've been looking at yourself not so much as a sheep, but perhaps like the dog or the cat, as being better than those others and, 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 and not really recognizing that it's all about grace and that it's your shepherd who has done everything. Just... Be before the Lord. This is what he's done. He has come and done everything for the sheep. And then he's brought us into this community. Commit yourself to being part of this community. If you are not yet, surrender your life to Christ. And then for all of us who are part of the community, commit yourself to building a community that is based on grace. Building a community that is based on grace.